And good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the AFNES conference. Today, we are here to discuss resources in the New York State Archives with a digital tour and a live Q&A. We are delighted to have as our guests today, Tom Ruler, the Assistant Commissioner and Director of the State Archives, Jim Foltz, the Head of Researcher Services in the Archives, and Marnica Gray, who's an archivist in researcher services there with the archive. And we want to give a special shout out and thank you to the Archives Partnership Trust, which is sponsoring this session here today and making this possible for us. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tom Ruler to begin our session. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much, Christine, and the rest of the folks at AFNES for giving us the opportunity to share with you a little bit about what's going on at the State Archives, uh, offer you a little bit of a tour, and then I hope that uh, at the end we have a pretty good question and answer session. Uh, you know my colleagues, Monica Gray and Jim Foltz, and you know how much they know, um, and uh, I'm always amazed at uh, they have forgotten more than I'll ever know. Uh, so it's it's pretty impressive. So you've got a great opportunity to have sort of a one-on-one -on -one with the folks who, who know everything about our collections. So thank you. I thought I'd start off by talking a little bit about where we're at uh, in terms of dealing with COVID and reopening to the public for researchers. And then uh, our virtual tour, uh, rather than try to do it on the fly, we've got a couple of videos we want to show you. And uh, I'll hopefully the transition when I share those screens will work out well for all of you. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll start off with what does it mean to come to the archives and see what's happening here when you are able to come in person. And then we've got a couple of videos that will walk you through the process of using our Ancestry.com resource as well as our online uh, searches and our, our other online resources. So with that, I'm gonna switch over uh, to a quick PowerPoint and uh, we'll see how this goes. And uh, we'll start from here. But I'm gonna go back a little bit. So again, Monica, Jim and I are very grateful for the opportunity to talk to all of you. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, we have never closed this, uh, during the pandemic. We continue to be open and accessible for researchers, but like everything else these days, we are all online and virtual. So we have done a tremendous amount of work to try to make sure that people continue to have access to the resources in the state archives and continue to be able to do the research that they need to do. Obviously, we can't do everything uh, because coming here and doing real deep research continues to be a critical part of our services and a critical part of discovering what's in the 26 miles of material that we preserve for you and all New Yorkers. But our online resources continue to stay available. Uh, our Ancestry.com resource, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit in terms of additional resources we put into Ancestry our online digital collections with tens of thousands, I'll say over 100,000 items uh, that you can discover and interact with uh, via our website. Our online name index, which provides a very easy way of searching for names across all of our collections. It's not everything that we have, it's not every name in the archives, but it is a very convenient way of research, researching and identifying specific individuals and specific names our online finding aids. That's the heart and soul of discovering what's here in the state archives. Uh, continue to be added to and have been available throughout this entire time. And of course, our online catalog, which many of you have been using for decades, which provides bibliographic level information about the collections in the state archives. I just wanna remind everyone that we have at least minimal descriptions of every single group of records that's in the state archives. Um, not everything has detailed container lists or detailed name indexes or anything like that, but we have some level of access to everything that we've preserved here at, at the archives. One of the things that's essential for us to be able to do is to provide service. So 
being able to be here to help you discover the resources and get access to materials is critical. There's lots of ways of interacting with us. Email, of course, is the best way. Our artref at nysed.gov, A-R-C-H-R-E-F at N-Y-S-E-D.gov continues to be monitored every day. Um, during the month of August, we were receiving 30 electronic mail messages from researchers every single business day. Uh, and we're responding to them. Uh, not necessarily within the same day, but we're responding to them. Monica and her crew are uh, doing a lot of work, making sure that people continue to have access to the resources that we preserve. Of course, you can call us, use the telephone, 518-474-8955. Uh, There's someone there to answer that phone every business day, all day. Uh, many of you have probably availed yourself of that opportunity and talked to our colleague, Bill Gorman, uh, who has done a tremendous amount of work answering the telephone. And uh, these days, uh, you can trust the Postal Service to send mail to the State Archives, and, uh, and you can trust us to put it back in the postal mail and send resources back to you. Um, when we get responses or re responses, requests, uh, of course, we're digitizing or making photocopies. During the month of August, we identified, located, and digitized over 10,000 pages of material. We're open. We're delivering services. We just can't allow folks to come in and do their research in person. So please take the time to visit us. And when you do visit us, uh, prepare and visit us online. Um, use the online resources that we've developed. During this pandemic time, without the need to provide public service, we've been able to have our staff significantly augment the online resources that we make available. Our online finding aids, for example, here uh, is an accretion for uh, a record series where we've been able to provide detailed information about the contents of each box uh, within a, a record series. We've added a lot of material to our name indexes. Again, that all of this is available off of the State Archives website. We have tried to use this time to make sure that the online resources that we maintain to enable you to locate and use materials in the State Archives are even full, more fully developed than they already were. And we'll continue to do that uh, as long as we can. Um, we've been doing it all along, but again, we've tried to amp up our efforts and increase the amount of information that we make available online. So if you're looking to do some research, start with the online finding aids. See if you can find the materials that you're looking for, or start with the name indexes and see if you can find the name or the individual that you're looking for. And then if you can find the records and locate something that we can duplicate or scan and make available to you, we'll do it. Just reach out to us, ask us, send a note to ArcGraph, give us a call, or drop us a letter in the mail. We're here to preserve and most importantly, make available these resources for you and others. So I want to talk a little bit about what happens when we do reopen and when it is possible for folks to come and do research at the State Archives. We've got a little bit of a tour, uh, what it takes to go from the front door all the way up to the 11th floor um, through a video. And I'm going to just move forward real quick here. I'm going to show you a couple of different videos. We've got a YouTube channel with hundreds of videos, including materials from our collections. Um, if you want to see uh, Governor Rockefeller open the state legislature, um, or if you want to learn about the construction of the New York State Thruway, um, or if you want to hear uh, education officials talk about new standards for education in the 1960s and 1970s, all that video is available. In addition to the materials from our collections, we've got a lot of videos that help you understand how to interact with the State Archives. I'm going to start with one that, walks, that gives you that virtual tour of what does it mean to come to our building? What does it mean to come and come into our research room? So I'm going to put on my glasses so I can see my screen and then I'm going to uh, move over and uh, sh share my, uh, my screen and uh, and bring something else to you. Show you that video. Hi, 
I'm Tom Ruller. I'm the director of the New York State Archives, located here in downtown Albany, New York. I'm standing here in front of the Cultural Education Center, the home of the State Archives. The Cultural Education Center is located at the south end of the Empire State Plaza on Madison Avenue. State Archives protects and preserves and makes available over 400 years worth of New York State's colonial and state government records all available for you to come and do research on. The State Archives is located on the 11th floor of the Cultural Education Center. We're open from 9.30 in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon. Parking is available for pay on either side of the building. If you come to the building, it's located right here at the south end of the Empire State Plaza. If you're using a GPS and want to find our facility, our address is 222 Madison Avenue in Albany, New York, 12230. Let's go inside to learn a little bit more about what it means to get into the State Archives. You'll enter the Cultural Education Center via the Madison Avenue entrance. Once you enter the main lobby, proceed back to the security desk and take the public elevators located to the right of the security desk to the 11th floor. The first place you'll go when you come upstairs to the 11th floor is our registration desk here. We'll ask you to fill out one of our research room registration forms. It's important that you bring a government issued photo ID in order to register to use the collections here at the State Archives. There are a number of rules connected with using the research room. You can't bring a backpack or bag in. You certainly can't bring a pen. We do ask you to bring a pencil. If you don't have a pencil, we've got some to provide to you. If you do have items that you bring with you, we have lockers here at the State Archives that you can use. We'll give you a key. It'll secure your goods, your belongings, and you'll be able to retrieve them when you're done with your visits. Well, now we're here in the research room. You've already registered. It's time to start to look for records. One of the things that's really important for any researcher that comes to the State Archives to use some of the 26 miles of material we preserve for New Yorkers is to prepare for your visit. It's very important that you visit our website prior to your visit. Look at our online finding aids to identify the materials that will satisfy your research question. Our website, www.archives.nyse.gov, under the Search for Records tab, has an abundance of materials that'll help you identify the specific items that you want to look at. Prior to your visit, it would be helpful if you filled out one of our records request forms and had it available and sent it in to our reference archivists prior to your visit so that we can pull the materials from our stacks and make them ready for your use. Some of our materials are located off site, so it may require a couple of days notice for us to be able to pull those items. Here in the research room, we also have a number of items that are ready referenced. We have a large collection of microfilm and microfilm readers that you can self-service use without necessarily needing to request them from an archivist. But again, looking at the website will tell you whether or not the records you're looking for are on microfilm or are still on paper and need to be pulled from our stacks. Once in the research room, we'll assign you a desk, one of the tables, and you'll be able to look at the materials at the desk. It's critical that you look at the website and equally critical that you talk to a reference archivist. You can do that well in advance by either calling us on the telephone, 518-474-8955, or sending us an email at archref, A-R-C-H-R-E-F, at nyse.gov. Our reference archivists understand and know our collections very well. We'll be able to connect you with the information sources that will satisfy your research inquiry and will make your visit productive and useful. So here we are in the secure climate controlled stacks where we preserve and protect 400 years worth of New York's documentary heritage. These are the official records of New York's colony and state preserved and made available for you. Researchers don't come back here. This is a secure area, and again, it's climate controlled to ensure that these records last as long as they possibly can. That's our fundamental mission here at the State Archives, is the preservation of these critical resources. There are 26 miles of records here. That's why it's really important for you as a researcher to come prepared to be as specific as possible so that we can identify the boxes of records or the microfilm reels 
make sure that they're available for you, and make sure that you have the tools you need in order to find the information you're searching for in those records. Visit our website, www.archives.nicid.gov. It's critical that you look through up those finding aids and find the box of material that's going to tell you what you need to know. Call us, 518-474-8955, or send us an email, arcref at nicid.gov. Your researcher's records request form is the key to unlocking the secrets and the knowledge that these materials hold. So that's a general sort of overview of what it means to come to the state archives. And we hope the day that we're open to the public and allow you to be able to come and do your research is sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, we do have a number of online resources. So I wanna share with you another video, a little bit of instructions on how to access the online resources of the, the state archives. an overview of the online resources of the New York State Archives. In this video, we will give a quick overview of our online research tools to demonstrate how to view our holdings and access some select materials remotely. On our website, there are several research tools available to help you find the best records for your research inquiry. The research topics page is a good place to start your search. Topics listed here reflect areas where our collections are particularly strong. Online access tools compiled for these topics describe the nature and scope of relevant records held by the State Archives and indicate the availability of microphone copies or digital versions of records. Many people visit the State Archives to conduct genealogical research. Before visiting, explore our online resources relating to genealogy and vital records, as well as those pertaining to related topics, such as military service records, court and probate records, and prison and reformatory records. In addition, our website has information about birth, marriage, and death certificates held by the New York State Department of Health. Let's go from here to the search for records page. If you don't find what you are looking for in research topics, consider searching our finding aids. A finding aid is a description of a series of archival materials. It contains information about the historical context of the series and the creator of the materials, a description of the contents, subjects, the structure and organization of the series, and box folder or item content lists that note the precise location of particular materials within the series. The full text search searches record series descriptions and box folder or item lists for words or phrases of interest. If you know the series number, access terms, title, or creator, use the more detailed fields to search. In digital collections, you can view digital copies of photographs and documents, listen to archival audio files, and watch historic film footage from the collections of the New York State Archives. Researchers specifically interested in photographic materials or archival audio and video should consider searching our digital collections directly. Publications include guides to historical records, educational resources, books, and other printed materials designed to aid researchers in finding resources for their topic of interest. Let's go from here to the researcher services page. Our contact information can be found on the Researcher Services page, as well as our frequently asked questions and links to online resources. Also on the Researcher Services page, you will find information on how to obtain microfilm through interlibrary loan. If a record you want to view specifies in the finding aid under alternate forms available, 
that there is a microfilm copy, as shown here, or is included in the list of frequently requested series on the researcher services page, you may be able to request a loan of that series on microfilm through your public or university library. Consulting these resources prior to visiting can help you determine if enough relevant records are available to warrant travel and confirm that research in these records cannot be done remotely. If, after conducting online research, you are interested in coming to the State Archives to work with specific records, contact the Researcher Services Unit by email or phone at least three business days prior to your planned visit. You can find more information on the Visit the Archives page. Certain records are stored off-site and require advanced notice to be made available in our public research room. Other records contain legally restricted material that must be reviewed by staff before disclosure to the public. As always, if you have any questions or are having trouble finding information, contact the archives. Thank you for visiting the New York State Archives and good luck in your research. If you need further assistance, please send an email to the address below. So well, many of you have probably used our Ancestry.com resources. Um, yeah, which... So uh, again, uh, good morning. My name is Rich Sloma. Ah, sorry, I apologize. New York State Archives webinar entitled "The New LGS One Featuring Records of." <laughs> uh, many of you have probably used our uh, our Ancestry.com resources and. Uh, one of the challenges that some folks face is how do you search those resources and not have to pay? How do you avoid the uh, send money to ancestry issue? So the last little video I'm going to show you is how to use our online ancestry resources. Many of you have probably used it many times, but hopefully you'll find this useful for the folks that you serve in the communities across the state if they're doing genealogical research and they have the opportunity to visit the State Archives and start their work in our free Ancestry.com resources. So I'm going to go back to what I was doing and uh, attempt to bring that video. How to create a free Ancestry New York account. In this video, we will show you how to create a free Ancestry New York account. We will also show you how to access the records that are freely available to you through this account and to avoid records that require a paid Ancestry subscription to view. You will be prompted to sign up after you view results from your first search. Begin by typing your New York State zip code into the search box on the Ancestry.com New York page of the New York State Archives website. Then click Submit. Begin your search two ways. Enter a person's information, for instance, their name and their date of birth, or search within a specific collection. To do this, scroll down to the Included Data Collections section. In this case, we're going to start with entering information about a specific person. Enter a search for John Smith. Click search. After viewing the results, click on a record. After you click on a record, Ancestry.com should prompt you to sign up for a free account. If the page does not look like this or lists payment options, the record is not part of Ancestry New York or the website brought you to the wrong page in error, and you may need to start the search over. Now let's create an account. Enter your first name, last name, email address, and a password of your choice. Make sure you can access this email address, because if you forget your password, it will be sent to this address. Click Continue. 
click all results to continue searching. If you need to change or limit your current search, to remain within the free Ancestry New York collection, you must click edit search, not new search. You cannot limit search results to the free Ancestry New York records if you move off the initial search. So to make sure that the results remain free, you must continually edit your search. In addition, do not click any of the facets listed to the left of your search results or any support links. These links will also take you away from the free Ancestry New York collection. In order to narrow down the results or search for a different person, click edit search and change any of the fields. Let's say we know for a fact John Smith was born in 1905. Let's add that to the field that says birth year. Here you can see the updated results. Remember, to narrow down these results, click on edit search and do not click on new search, the facets, or other support links. Thank you for visiting the New York State Archives and good luck in your search. If you need further assistance, please send an email to the address below. How to create a free Ancestry New York account. In this video, we will show you how to create a free Ancestry New York. So, a virtual tour, in person and online. Again, we don't have a definite time when we will be able to be open to researchers. Uh, we're hoping that we'll have some about of approval in the coming months, um, but time will, will tell. In the meantime, we really encourage you to avail yourselves of those online resources and give us a call, send us an email, drop us a letter in the, in the postal mail. But until then, and for the next, I'll say half an hour, we've got the opportunity to talk to you in person. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Monica Gray, who might talk a little bit about some of the additional resources that we've added to Ancestry.com lately. Hi, everybody. Um, the records that we have shared with Ancestry are really the collections that are very, very rich in names and um, represent our collections and New Yorkers most strongly. So we've focused on military records, there are a lot of prison inmate records and both of the, um, but, sorry, to back up a little bit, this last couple of years, Ancestry has been doing more filming on site. So we already have pretty strong collections in Ancestry. Those existing collections are being added to. So if the previous filming stopped in 1935, say, those records now have been added and will go up through the 1940s but we're adding a couple of major um, new collections that are gonna be pretty interesting. One of those are civil service employment cards. Those are summary cards. There's usually one or more cards per person. And each card represents a very quick summary of that individual's career with the state. What makes them interesting is that they start in the 1890s. I'm just gonna check. Yeah, 1894 to 1954 is the date range. They usually have the person's name, they're filed in alphabetical order, um, and they will record the um, agency the person worked for, their position, their rate of pay. Sometimes there are little notes about vacation or name changes. Um, they represent principally people who worked for state government agencies, but they do also include employees in local governments. So it's really worth um, while you can contact us and ask the image the files have all the excuse me the cards have all been imaged ancestry's created an index to them and that will be uploaded we've been told by the end of the year um i think the current times mean that a lot of deadlines have been extended but that data set should be going up certainly within the next six months another interesting set of records are peddlers licenses for um, traveling salesmen, traveling peddlers who moved around the state. The um, span dates for those, 1840 to 1896. So that's a really nice snapshot of people moving around the state in the 19th century. 
And then there's a very brief recurrence from 1949 to 1956. So that's another interesting data set that um, contains records that might be of great interest at local level. Um, I think just in the interests of time, I might leave it at that. And then if questions come up a little bit more during the end, we can revisit the ancestry collections. Thank you, Monica. Um, we've, as you all know, you've probably read in the papers and hear a lot about it because we talk quite a bit about it is we have an enormous collection of pre-1847 statewide court records. Um, Jim Fultz, uh, who, who you all know uh, already knows about a lot about everything, um, definitely knows a lot about our court records collection. Jim, could you talk a little bit about the court records? Be happy to. Oh, I've been to a lot of APNES events over 30 plus years, but the first one online. So I'm glad to be here. Uh, Everybody in the audience, I'm sure, is familiar with probate records, wills, administrations, that kind of thing. But there are many other court records that are, should be of interest to local historians. Uh, you have interests probably in bis business history, social history, uh, family history. And you can benefit very much, we think, from the court records, the older court records in the state archives. Uh, you're probably all familiar that the county clerk is the custodian of court records uh, in the civil and criminal higher courts within your counties. But in fact, before 1847, as Tom said, there were statewide courts, the state Supreme Court, the state court of chancery that produced records that have been preserved that are now in the archives that relate to every county in the state. Uh, so keep that in mind wherever you are. Uh, specifically, what are those records uh, that I'm talking about? Uh, the state archives, from a long back story, has almost all wills filed or recorded in New York before 1787, when the modern, or not so modern anymore, surrogates court was established in every county. Uh, the archives also holds uh, a huge volume of civil court records for all parts of the state, as I said, for the state Supreme Court, predecessor to the modern Supreme Court uh, from 1691 to 1847, and its companion court with different jurisdiction, the Court of Chancery, modeled on an English court whose records uh, range from 1704 to 1847. Uh, what kind of business did the old Supreme Court uh, in early New York handle? Well, like the modern Supreme Court, it heard and determined actions to recover a debt or damages uh, from injuries committed to uh, a person or a property or from a breach of contract. Uh, the Supreme Court also produced many papers relating to insolvencies, which resembled bankruptcies. Uh, those records include detailed inventories, of personal and real property. The Chancery Court, uh, it handled different types of business, mostly than the state, state and colonial Supreme Court. Uh, proceedings like mortgage foreclosures, guardianships for women and minors, uh, divorces under state law starting in 1787. You go not to the county clerk before 1847 for a divorce file, but to the state archives for uh, records of the Court of Chancery. Uh, and we also have an, among the records of this colonial and state Supreme Court before about 1800, many criminal proceedings, especially and importantly, prosecutions of loyalists uh, during and right after the Revolutionary War. Those records have never been used by scholars. They have now been digitized. They will be posted on our website along with the name index to the loyalists. So people in New York and their descendants in Canada, I think will find these of great interest. Uh, and there's also a lot of other 18th century criminal cases, which are hard to find on the local level, because as many of you know, you know uh, county clerks often do not preserve very many older uh, court records uh, that they once possessed. 
Early court records provide important data about uh, New York's so-called dark age of documentation before the middle of the 19th century, when the detailed census records commence, when newspaper coverage becomes much more abundant. Uh, so if you can find data on an individual or a business or an event that might have resulted in a court action and you don't find it in the county clerk's office, come to the state archives. The records occupy thousands and thousands of boxes. Most of them are indexed one way or another. They're complicated, yes, but we will guide you through them. Thanks for attending. Thank you, Jim. Jim, one question came up on the chat uh, about the records of the Oyer and Terminer courts. Yes. Um, where would uh, those be? After about 1800, if any survive, and probably they'd be minute books, not filed papers, they're going to be in the county clerk's office. As I said, before 1800, there was more centralization of court records uh, funneled to the clerk's office of the state and colonial Supreme Court here in the state archives. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. The, the last little area we want to highlight is uh, local government records on microfilm. Uh, many of you are very familiar with our local government records management improvement fund grants. And in the, in the early and mid 1990s, there was a significant amount of work done in local governments to microfilm those records. Those records also augmented a lot of microfilm that was done during the American Revolution bicentennial. Um, which you're probably familiar with the little publication that was produced by the Bicentennial Commission highlighting local government records on microfilm. One of the things that we've been focused on quite a bit uh, is the providing much more detailed information on the real lists from those local government records on microfilm that were deposited in the state archives. Part of the agreement with the local governments was that a use copy would be sent to the state archives. Um, the Silver Master was sent to the state archives for preservation and a use copy was also made available. So if you go to our website now, you might find a lot more local government records on microfilm, some of which are difficult to obtain or difficult to locate. So hopefully we'll be able to connect you or your researchers who you're working with with more information of, from a, of a local nature. Uh, so hopefully there's, there's some resources there. So I guess in the interest of time, we've got about 20 minutes left uh, of our session. I thought we'd open it up to some question and answers. And there's a couple already here in the chat. Uh, so one, the first question is, uh, do we have cemetery records? Yes, I got a request from Salt Lake City, Utah. And I know that there is a, a cemetery. It's the Van Cott Leah Cemetery, and it's on findagrave.com. It states there are eight headstones. And I went to the longitude and latitude GPS to find it in our town. And it, there, I have been unsuccessful to find it. When I searched the back property and asked permission, to go on the property to find these headstones, I didn't find any. Do you have a cemetery records um, of people that in, it's 1797. He was a he went out to form the Mormon Church from our town. I'll, I'll respond to that quickly. It's is it's an easy no. The state archives has no cemetery records at all for any period or location. In New York State, the town government is responsible for keeping up, maintaining, uh, protecting abandoned cemeteries. So our, my advice is contact the town clerk in the town where you think the cemetery is located. I go there every Thursday and do my research at the town clerk. They do not have anything from, on that cemetery. So I'll have to, I'll have to go back to find a grave and see what the longi GPS longitude and latitude and see if they have a record of exactly where it is. Jim, the Division of Cemeteries told me that that law is actually only in effect after some time in the 1940s. Cemeteries that went defunct prior to that are not governed by that law 
And that's why you have a lot of early family cemeteries that towns tend not to take over. I don't know the truth in that, but I contacted our Division of Cemeteries office in Syracuse, and that's what they informed me. Yes, there's one cemetery that I tried to get the town of New Lebanon to take care of because it, it has overgrown, and there are Revolutionary War soldiers there, and I wanted them to maintain it. They weren't willing to take the responsibility for it in New Lebanon. I know some towns, in fact, do maintain such cemeteries despite the law, yeah. but it's good information to have. I, again, I could be wrong. I just, I, I know that's what they've told us when, when it's, basically it had to have a cemetery association for them to do it. Yes. Was the way it was explained to me. Yeah. And some of these cemeteries of the American Revolutionary War do not have cemetery associations. Um, so it's up to a historical society or something like that to, to maintain them or do something with them. I have one more suggestion quickly. Uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution over many decades has transcribed older cemeteries across the state. Those typewritten transcriptions have never been, uh, to my knowledge, digitized or published, but they are available in the state library. So we suggest that you contact them. Maybe they have something. Thank you. And they are, that's a pretty extensive collection, the DAR cemetery records. Good, good point, Jim. Another question that we got is, are, do we have at the State Archives any records on canal boatmen? <laughs> I'll respond again. Uh, <laughs> we have four or 5,000 cubic feet of Erie Canal records, uh, dating from the first contract in 1817 right up through the completion of the barge canal and maintenance of the barge canal and so on right up to the near present. Ordinary boat men, employees of boat owners, we have nothing on. Uh, but for a limited period in the middle of the 19th century, certificates of boat owners giving the name of the boat, their hailing place, uh, the name of the boat, that kind of thing are in the archives. That's the good news. Bad news is they're not in very good condition and there are thousands of them and they're not indexed. So we're unable to search for them, but you know, you could come when we reopen and if you had a, quite a bit of time and persistence, you might be able to find something. Excellent point. And, and just in, in general, many of those we do, as Jim points out, we have an enormous amount of canal material and much of it is very difficult to access. Um, and uh, so that's, that's one of the things that will keep us busy and keep us employed for many years to come. Um, there is a, a, another question about funeral home records. Uh, does the State Archives have any records from funeral homes? And I, I, I knew the answer. Even I, I could answer that one. Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't have records from funeral homes, um, unfortunately. Um, one of the folks asked, are there plans to digitize the microfilms of the local government records? At this time, no, there's not a plan to digitize. This is uh, probably literally tens of thousands of reels of microfilm. Um, so we don't have plans to digitize them. One caveat with those local government rec microfilm records is it's, it's not quite scattershot, but it's, it's not a consistent set of records from each local government across the state. So there's a, you're sort of shooting uh, in the dark a little bit to see if we have the records of a particular town, village, or, or city, or school district. Uh, but uh, it, it's, there's, there's, there's a lot. So it's, it's definitely worth uh, taking a look. Any other questions? Is there a way to learn how to digitize microfilm? I have a machine in my office hooked up to a printer. I, we have a number of online resources. If you look in our, at our State Archives website under Managing Records, there are some great resources on managing microfilm projects or managing digitization projects. In addition, the, our DIPSNY program, or Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York, has a number of webinars on digitization. Uh, so I would start there and uh, hopefully it will give you some of the information you, you need. There's a lot of challenges with digitization. Uh, my colleague Monica can uh, probably nod her head and say, oh yeah, it, it's, it's not simply just taking pictures. 
Um, it's, you know, what are, the, what are the standards, what are the targets, and most importantly, how are you going to create the metadata, which will enable you to retrieve that information once you've digitized it. Could I just add there that um, I found YouTube a really excellent resource for this kind of thing. Um, you know, it's amazing what people know and how generous they are with their time in preparing a video and putting it online that talks you through a problem because they faced the same problem and figured it out. Um, also, you know, if you have a specific question like that, you can also phone us and, and ask. Um, I've, as Tom said, worked with our microphone quite a lot and would be prepared to, um, you know, spend 15 minutes on the phone with you, just sharing ideas, explaining what we did. If I have any documentation of our processes, I'm very willing to share it because, um, you know, people have been generous with their time in helping us. We're here to be same part of that same service and community. One thing I, we've talked a lot about accessing the resources and in our collections, most of you are very familiar with the other side of our program that provides services to local governments and non-government repositories in terms of preservation and access and records management. All of those resources are available on the website and a lot of the tools and techniques that we talk to others about are derived from the good work of folks like Monica where they've learned a lot. So you can go right to the source and, and talk to Monica and our other colleagues and learn a little bit more about our experiences. Are there other questions or things we can answer about the collections here at the State Archives? One of the things that I mentioned is that we, of course, uh, um, yes, the, yes, I see someone has mentioned the Regional Library Councils as well. If you're a member of the Regional Library Council, um, you, can, you can interact with them and get some services from them as well. Um, the, uh, is the availability of photocopies or, or digital copies? And uh, I think one of the challenges that we face is what's the, the right balance between the number of photocopies in response to or of digitized, digitized pages in response to a researcher request. And again, we encourage you to ask us. Um, if something is, is really big and voluminous, maybe it's something that's best served by having you come in person. If it's a little less, I think there are some approaches that we can take to delivering the content to you. Could I add there that in the last couple of years, we have added um, new equipment to our digitization processes. So we have a couple of really nice um, overhead scanners that allow us to put down a file and just turn the page and produce um, a PDF copy of a whole file very easily. So instead of people having to make a choice between photocopies and a high resolution scan as they used to, we can now produce um, kind of a, a digital representation that's not perfect, but it's really good, it's really readable, you get a nice image and it's 25 cents a page, which is much more within line with most people's budget. We also can email you the results. And within the last year or so, we've also introduced payment by credit card. So you can pay by credit card and the whole transaction is really streamlined and smooth and enables you to make a request, get the copies, pay for them, get delivery in a very uh, short amount of time. I have a question, one more question. Um, we're trying to revitalize a historical society that's been active for, inactive for 10 years. And I, at a meeting, an outdoor meeting that's uh, COVID and social distancing uh, on October 10th, they're going to appoint me curator. Would you be able to help me how to digitize the stuff inside our historical society? Sure, we'd be happy to provide you with some, some advice and some guidance. Uh, just, uh, just reach out to, to any of us. If you, that email address that we said about 100 times in the, in the videos. Uh, I have it. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, just send us an email note and, uh, and we'll connect you to the, the right folks that can give you some assistance. Thank you. You're welcome. If you mentioned that you're part of the, um, the AFNI's network as well, that will help people. Oh, that's that good. Yeah, that, 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 that would be useful. Thank you. Anything else? The 
again, we're really grateful for the opportunity to share a little bit with you some of the behind the scenes of what's going on at the State Archives and hopefully have given you some guidance on how to interact with us. Visit that YouTube channel um, or refer others to it uh, to help them learn how to work with the State Archives and what it takes to, to visit virtually as well as in person. And don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. We're, we're here to assist and support and to help you do the good work that you do. So again, thank you all very much. And thank you, Christine, uh, for organizing this and uh, giving us the, the opportunity to talk. And thank you. Can we have a virtual round of applause for our presenters? Thank you very much. This was very helpful and provided great information. I want to remind you we are breaking now for lunch, but if you would like to, please stop into the Pomeroy Foundation's virtual booth thank them for their sponsorship and get your questions answered. Even if you were there yesterday, there are two different staff members there today who might be able to pro provide different perspectives on your project, so do that. And then we look forward to having everyone join us at one o'clock for our AFNI's annual meeting. You should have received an email this morning that would include a link to our agenda and the documents for the meeting. You also should have received a link to voting we ask you not to vote until the meeting starts so that you can receive all of the information you need to uh, make an informed decision when casting those votes. So we'll see you all later this afternoon. Thanks again, Tom and staff. We'll, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.